1875, because in 1876, Democrats gained control of the U.S. House for the first time since 1861. Therefore, with the divided Congress, Democrats successfully blocked any further progress in the civil rights arena. Facing such strident and irrational Democrat obstructionists, the enthusiasm for fighting in that arena soon waned and civil rights momentum was lost. However, not only did Democrats gain the U.S. House in 1876, but they were able to bring Reconstruction to a close by having all federal troops withdrawn from the South, thus removing the final protective barrier between black Americans and those Democrats aggressively seeking to violate their newfound civil rights. And that federal protection had been crucial to black Americans at that time, for as a Republican election official from Mississippi explained in 1868. Could you explain the situation as regards protection? The rebels never needed protection. They've had it all the time. It's only the Republicans, especially the Negroes, who need protection. The reason for the 1876 withdrawal of federal troops from the South had been the presidential election between Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and Democrat Samuel Tilden. 185 electoral votes had been needed to win the presidency, and when the votes were counted, Democrat Tilden had received 184 electoral votes and Republican Hayes had received 165. Neither had received the necessary votes to win, but there was a total of 20 disputed electoral votes that had not yet been counted. If Republican Hayes received all 20 of these votes, he would become president. If Democrat Tilden received even one of those votes, he would become president. The uncounted votes came from the three disputed southern states of Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. In those three states, dual election results had been reported. One tally in Florida showed Republicans had won. The other tally showed Democrats had won. The same was true in South Carolina and Louisiana. Why were there disputed results? Why were there two different tallies of votes? Because in each of those three states, Democrats had been extremely active both in suppressing the black vote through violence and in altering counts at the ballot box. One political cartoon from that day depicted the type of violence that helped alter the count. A Democrat is inviting blacks to come vote, but notice that inside, an armed gunman sits awaiting beside the ballot box to ensure that the black voter reached the right decision. Consequently, many blacks did not even try to vote. Representative John Roy Lynch, shortly after that presidential election, personally experienced the same type of vote counting difficulties as had Rutherford B. Hayes. Lynch explained that those difficulties had come from those Democrats whom he described as, quote, the ballot box stuffer and the shotgun holder of the South. He therefore declared, I say to you gentlemen that in my state, the official return is an official fraud. When I ran for Congress, in the 6th District of Mississippi in 1880, I know that there were not less than 5,000 votes cast for me that were counted for the Democrat that ran against me. Now bear in mind, the official report gave him 5,000 of my votes. If these fraudulent votes for him are counted, then you say to me, we will only admit you on what the Democrats choose to give you. Now I say that is wrong. Voter fraud by Democrats was indeed a problem in the South. In addition to changing the voting counts or intimidating voters, Harper's Weekly showed another way that Southern Democrats were able to obtain additional votes. They simply took the names off cemetery headstones and then cast a fraudulent vote in the name of a dead voter. Returning to the 1876 presidential election, by keeping black Americans from voting in the disputed states and by altering the voting counts, Democrats claimed that they had won those three states. However, the Republicans counted the suppressed African-American votes and ignored the fraudulent votes, and they claimed that they had won those three states. Since the Electoral College did not count any of the disputed votes, and since neither presidential candidate could win the election without them, Congress was required to decide who would become president. Congress convened a commission of 15 members to hear the issue, a commission composed of five members from the House, five from the Senate, and five from the Supreme Court. Since the House was in Democratic control, three of its five members were Democrats. Since the Senate was in Republican control, three of its five members were Republicans. From the Supreme Court, two of its five members were Republicans, two were Democrats, and one was an Independent. Thus, the commission was made up of seven Democrats, 
seven Republicans and one independent. However, the one independent resigned from the Supreme Court and went home to become a state senator. Since the only remaining members of the Supreme Court were Republicans, the departed member was replaced with a Republican, meaning that the commission was composed of seven Democrats and eight Republicans. The commission investigated and determined that there had been voter suppression through the killing, injuring, and intimidation of black Americans by Democrats. The commission, therefore, by an eight to seven vote, awarded the election to Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. The Democratic House, however, refused to ratify the findings of the commission, and the Democrats threatened to filibuster those findings. The result was America had no president. The election controversy continued for four months until a solution was proposed, a solution now called the Great Compromise. The Democrats offered to ratify the commission's report, but only if the last federal troops were withdrawn from Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. If Republicans did not agree, and if federal troops were not removed from those three states, America would remain without a president. The proposal was finally agreed to. Federal troops therefore left the three remaining states in which they had been stationed, thus officially ending Reconstruction in the South. Rutherford B. Hayes became president. Following the withdrawal of the last federal troops, from that point forward, the South became known as the, quote, solid Democratic South. Southern state legislatures were again solidly in the hands of Democrats, and white supremacy in the South was reestablished. By the way, recall Representative Josiah Walls? It was during this same contested election in Florida that the Democrats had challenged his credentials for the second time and that the democratically controlled House had sent him home. He had survived the first challenge when Republicans were in charge, but when sent home the second time, with the state back in the hands of Democrats as a result of the Great Compromise, Walls was therefore defeated by white Democrats, thus ending his congressional career. Eventually, all remaining black legislators in the other Southern Democratic states were also defeated and removed from Congress. Democrats thus succeeded in barring Southern blacks from federal elective offices for an additional 70 years. Returning to 1876, public debate began to focus on issues that had already been raised in earlier civil rights laws, laws and issues that Democrats were now trying to reverse, issues such as education. For example, this piece entitled Politics and the School Question, Attitude of the Republican and Democratic Parties in 1876, examined the contrasting positions of the two parties on the issue of education. The Republicans had supported public education for all children, regardless of race, but Democrats not only opposed public education for all children, but in fact strongly supported segregated education. For example, this is a published and widely distributed pro-segregation speech by Democratic Congressman James Harper of North Carolina. Notice its title, Separate Schools for Whites and Colored with Equal Advantages. Mixed Schools? Never. Similarly, in 1875, the Democratic Executive Committee of Ohio issued this piece on public education to, as they said, expose the tricks of the Republican Executive Committee. What were the so-called dirty tricks of Republicans to which Democrats objected? And what was intended to be an insult about Republicans? The only positive action of the Republican Party on the school question in Ohio is to destroy the system by requiring that whites and blacks be educated together. The Democratic response against open education for black youth sometimes went beyond words to acts of violence, such as when they burned down eight schools in Memphis in which black youth were being taught. Additionally, since churches in the South frequently provided education for youth, such as St. Philip's Church in Richmond, churches were also frequently burned down. And this is a flyer distributed by the Klan in North Carolina showing a school teacher being stripped and beaten. That flyer, distributed to teachers, warned, Miss Whoever, we send you a picture of the way we treated a Yankee school ma'am in this county last year. Beware lest you share the same fate. The evidences of the widespread democratic opposition to equal education for black youth are numerous and abundant, and black Americans knew how important a good education was to their own future. As Representative John Roy Lynch had accurately noted, No educated people can be held in bondage. And black leaders understood that good education was important not only to black Americans, but also to the future of the country. Representative Joseph Hain Rainey, speaking on a bill to strengthen the education system for all students, including young black students, 
wisely reminded the opposing Democrats, I shall remind the House of one thing more. The youth now springing up to manhood will be the future lawmakers and rulers of our country. That they should be intelligent and thoroughly educated is a prime necessity and of great importance, which is admitted by all and denied by none. All that may be done with this end in view will be returned with an increased interest. I truly hope that those Democrats who oppose this bill will reconsider their opposition and give it their vote when the question shall again be before the House. For one, I shall give it my hearty support, believing it to be just and beneficial in its provisions. Unfortunately, 87% of the Democrats in Congress at that time voted against that education bill. Segregated, inferior, and dilapidated schools for blacks became the norm in the southern states under Democratic control. In 1954, the Supreme Court and Brown v. Board of Education finally struck down state segregation laws in education, thus reinstating what Republicans had done nearly 75 years earlier in the 1875 Civil Rights Bill. What was the Southern Democratic response to the court decision finally ending segregated education? There was a twofold response, one of words and one of actions. In the category of words, 100 Democrats in Congress, 19 senators and 81 representatives passed the Southern Manifesto denouncing the court's decision to end segregation. Those 100 Democrats declared in 1956 that desegregation was, quote, certain to destroy the system of public education and that there would be what they called an explosive and dangerous condition created by this decision. Also in the category of words, Democratic Governor Herman Talmadge of Georgia issued a written attack on the court decision and promised that, quote, there will never be mixed schools while I am governor. He even warned of forthcoming bloodshed because of the desegregation decision. Mississippi Democratic Governor James Coleman, when asked in an interview on Meet the Press whether the public schools of Mississippi would ever be integrated, succinctly replied, I would say that a baby born in Mississippi today will never live long enough to see an integrated school. This was typical of what many Southern Democrats did in the category of words. But the Democratic response went beyond words and also included actions. Following the 1954 school desegregation decision, Southern Democratic governors went to extreme lengths to keep the court decision from going into effect. For example, in 1956, Democratic Governor Alan Shivers of Texas deployed the Texas Rangers to keep blacks from entering schools in Mansfield. The following year, 1957, Democratic Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas called out the National Guard to keep black students from entering Central High School in Little Rock. However, Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower quickly intervened and he federalized the Arkansas National Guard to take it away from Governor Faubus. Eisenhower then replaced the Arkansas Guard with 1,200 troops from the elite 101st Airborne Division, ordering them to protect the nine black students who had chosen to go to Central High. Democrats in the U.S. Senate strongly protested against Eisenhower's actions to protect these black students. Georgia Democratic Governor Marvin Griffin also attacked Eisenhower's actions and promised that as long as he held office, he would, quote, maintain segregation in the schools and the races will not be mixed come hell or high water, end quote. To prepare for the possibility that Eisenhower might do in Georgia what he had done in Arkansas, Legislation was introduced in the democratically controlled Georgia legislature so that if desegregation was attempted, the public schools of the state would be dissolved and replaced with state-run private schools so that blacks could be excluded. These types of schools became known as segregation academies. Meanwhile, in Arkansas, Democratic Governor Faubus, unable to prevent black students from attending school because of the federal protection they had received, simply shut down the schools for the next year to prevent further attendance. And Virginia Democratic Governor James Allman, like other Southern Democratic governors, also shut down public schools rather than permit black students to attend. In 1960 in Louisiana, where Democratic Governor Jimmy Davis supported segregation, it required four federal marshals to accompany little Ruby Bridges so she could attend a public elementary school in New Orleans. When Ruby entered that school, every other parent in that school pull their children out of the school, and for the entire year, little Ruby was the only student in that school building, just Ruby 
and her school teacher from Boston. So deep-seated was the racism among Southern Democratic leaders that when the 1964 Civil Rights Bill became law, Lester Maddox, who became Democratic governor of Georgia, sold the fast food business that he owned rather than serve blacks in his restaurant. And in 1960, Mississippi Democratic Governor Hugh White even requested that evangelist Billy Graham segregate his crusades, something Graham refused to do. In fact, when South Carolina Democratic Governor George Timmerman learned that Billy Graham had invited African Americans to a Reformation rally at the South Carolina State Capitol, he promptly denied use of the facilities to the evangelist. This type of democratic response against black Americans and the whites who supported them was common across much of the South. And the reasons given by democratic leaders to justify this disgusting behavior was simply states' rights. The same rhetoric they had used a century earlier, first to justify slavery and the creation of a slaveholding nation, and then to enact laws enforcing segregation and withholding voting rights from black Americans for the next 80 years after the Civil War. During the era of desegregation, in an effort to remake the image of racism so long and so properly associated with the Southern cry of states' rights, Southern leaders began to claim that the Southern Confederate battle flag, the quintessential symbol of a perverted states' rights philosophy, was actually a symbol of heritage rather than hate. Consequently, many today wrongly but innocently believe that the battle flag of the South is about heritage and not about hate something easily refuted by historical facts and documents. Returning to the school desegregation situation, some Democratic Southern governors did work for integration, including Tennessee Governor Frank Clement, Florida Governor Leroy Collins, and Kentucky Governor Happy Chandler. But these tended to be the exceptions among Southern Democratic governors rather than the rule and their admirable behavior was clearly overshadowed by the negative behavior of the others. Democratic leaders long stood in the doorways of schoolhouses and told black children, we don't want you in here to get the good education that our children are getting. Today, as many black students have become mired in urban schools that are often failing or deteriorating, Democrats are once again standing in the doorway. Consider the situation in Washington, D.C., where 84% of the city's students are black. Despite the fact that nearly $13,500 is spent each year on every student in the district, an amount almost twice the national average of $7,500 per student, D.C. schools currently rank among the worst of all schools in the nation. Congress therefore moved to provide help by providing a $7,500 voucher for low-income students who are trapped in failing schools, a voucher they can redeem to attend a better school, a school chosen by that student and his or her parents. When that congressional proposal came to a vote, only 1% of Democrats in Congress supported vouchers and parental choice in education, even though nationally, nearly 70% of African Americans with children support educational choice. While Democrats once stood in the doorways of public schools and told black students, we don't want you in here, they're again standing in the doorways of public schools, this time telling black students that they don't want them out, that they want them to remain in failing schools. It appears that for a century and a half, Democrats have often taken wrong positions on educational opportunity for black Americans. Returning back to the 19th century, Representative John Roy Lynch, a congressman from Mississippi, was mentioned earlier. He had grown up as a slave until freed by the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Within a decade, he had become Speaker of the House in Mississippi and later received presidential appointments from Republican Presidents Benjamin Harrison and William McKinley. Lynch was appointed an Army officer during the Spanish-American War, earned a law degree, and was the chairman of the Republican Party in Mississippi. He was a leader who served his state and his nation well. In 1884, John Roy Lynch became the first black American to preside over a national political convention, the Republican National Convention in Chicago. Lynch's love for his country was still very evident and reflected the patriotism still evident among African Americans today. I love the land that gave me birth. I love the stars and stripes. This country is where I intend to live where I expect to die, to preserve the honor of the national flag, and to maintain perpetually the union of the states. Hundreds, and I may say thousands, of noble, brave, and true-hearted colored men have fought, bled, and died 
While Lynch was the first black American to preside over a national political convention, he was not the last. U.S. Senator Edward Brooke presided over the 1968 National Republican Convention, and Representative J.C. Watts presided over the 2000 National Republican Convention. While three black Americans have presided over national conventions for Republicans, to date, Democrats have never had a black American preside over any of their national Democratic conventions. Following the removal of federal troops from the South after the agreement of 1876, Republicans sought different means to try to secure the rights of black Americans in the South. For example, Republicans posted handbills such as this one from 1880, reminding Southern Democrats first of the federal laws protecting black voting rights and then warning of huge fines for violations. The presidential election of that year, of 1880, was between Republican James A. Garfield and Northern Democrat Winfield Scott Hancock. Hancock had been a successful Union general during the Civil War, but after the war, he was reassigned because of his leniency toward unreconstructed Democrats. Recall that Northern or Union Democrats, such as Hancock, sought to preserve the Union, but not to end slavery or to grant equality to African Americans. Since Hancock was a Democrat, even though he had fought for the Union, this 1880 piece reminded citizens why they should not vote Democratic in that election. The reasons given in this piece would be considered strong language today. At that time, however, they were nothing more than reminders. The facts recorded in this piece were widely known and understood by voters in that day. Why I will not vote the Democratic ticket. I am opposed to the Democratic Party, and I will tell you why. Every state that seceded from the United States was a Democratic state. Every man that shot Union soldiers was a Democrat. Every man that loved slavery better than liberty was a Democrat. The man that assassinated Abraham Lincoln was a Democrat. Every man that sympathized with the assassin, every man glad that the noblest president ever elected was assassinated, was a Democrat. Every man that wept over the corpse of slavery was a Democrat. Every man that cursed Lincoln because he issued the Proclamation of Emancipation, the grandest paper since the Declaration of Independence, every one of them was a Democrat. Soldiers, every scar you have got on your heroic bodies was given you by a Democrat. Every scar, every arm that is lacking, every limb that is gone, every scar is a souvenir of a Democrat. That broadside then contrasted the Republicans with the Democrats. The Republicans have done some noble things, things that will be remembered as long as there is history. But there are some things they did not do. They did not use an army to force slavery into Kansas. They were not Knights of the Golden Circle. They did not oppose emancipation. They were not Ku Klux. They did not scourge and hang and shoot and murder men for opinion's sake. They did not organize the Louisiana White League or the South Carolina Rifle Clubs. They did not drench the South with the blood of inoffensive colored men. The piece concluded with a simple question. Can the Democratic Party and all Democrats say as much? A further indication that the Democrats were well known for their bloody atrocities against blacks is seen in this illustration from Harper's Weekly showing the major elements and influences of the Democratic Party. The illustration shows the various banners under which Democrats gathered, and those banners included the stars and bars carried by Confederate soldiers, the pro-slavery banner, the Ku Klux Klan banner, the New York rioters banner, referring to the massive riots instigated against blacks by the Democrats in New York, leading to the killing and injuring of as many as 1,000 citizens, and finally, the Democratic banner of repudiation, referring to the Democrats' opposition to paying the national debt incurred in putting down the Southern pro-slavery rebellion. These were the various movements led by Democrats, and Americans in that day knew what Democrats stood for. By the 1880s, a movement called Southern Redemption had begun in earnest. Southern Redemption was a political movement to redeem the South from the Reconstruction Acts and the Civil Rights Laws passed by Republicans laws and acts that Southern Democrats believed threatened their version of a Southern society. The best way for the Democratic legislatures to redeem their state was to deprive black Americans of their political rights 
through the passage of state laws that restricted, removed, or even blatantly violated their civil rights, as well as through the prompt repeal of state laws that had suppressed Klan violence. Representative John Roy Lynch, who not only had helped pass the original federal civil rights laws, but who also witnessed their subsequent violation at the state level throughout the period of Southern Redemption, accurately noted, the opposition to civil rights in the South is confined almost exclusively to states under democratic control. Democrats understood how important it was to their survival to prevent blacks from voting. In fact, this illustration from that period shows an allegory of the Bible story of Samson who lost his strength when his hair was cut. In the picture, you see that the woman has used her razor, called the lost cause regained, to cut the black Samson's hair and cause him to lose his strength. And what is his hair? His strength? It is called suffrage or voting. With the strength or the vote of black Americans removed, you see the various democratic groups and leaders rejoicing in the background, including Confederates, the KKK, pro-slavery forces, and various famous democratic leaders of that day, including General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who headed the Ku Klux Klan. By the way, notice the phrase, the Democratic barbecue, and that Democrats are burning various books in the foreground, including the Holy Bible. As this illustration confirms, limiting black voting became the major goal for Southern Democrats. Given the explicit federal voting protections that had been established by the 14th and 15th Amendments and by the numerous federal civil rights laws, it was no easy task for Democrats to circumvent these protections. It required devious and cunning methods, and Southern Democratic legislatures implemented almost a dozen separate devices to keep blacks from voting. The first device was the poll tax, a fee paid by a voter before he could vote. The fee was high enough that most poor were unable to pay the tax and therefore were unable to vote. And while some Southern whites were poor, Nearly all Southern blacks were poor, having just emerged from slavery and not yet having established an independent means of living. Literacy tests were the second means that Democrats used to disenfranchise blacks. Literacy tests required a voter to demonstrate a certain level of specific knowledge before he could vote. In some cases, the test was 20 pages long for blacks, and those administering the test were white Democrats who nearly always ruled that blacks were illiterate. Grandfather clauses were the third device used to disenfranchise black Americans, allowing only those individuals to vote whose father or grandfather had been registered to vote prior to the passage of the 15th Amendment. This law ensured that poor and illiterate whites could vote, but not blacks. The fourth device was suppressive election procedures. This included the use of multiple ballots. That is, a Republican voter might be required to cast a ballot in up to eight separate locations, or sometimes to vote for each individual Republican on a ballot at a separate location before the ballot would be counted. Democratic officials often failed to inform black voters of this complicated procedure, and their ballots were therefore disqualified. Democrats also used what were called hide-and-seek polling places, moving voting boxes to unknown locations at the last minute, and then posting armed guards in case any black should stumble upon the voting box. The fifth device included the use of so-called black codes, later called Jim Crow laws, to restrict the freedoms and economic opportunities of blacks. Representative Robert Brown Elliott reported, Among the first acts of legislation adopted by the Southern Democratic states were laws which imposed upon the colored race oppressive disabilities and burdens and curtailed their rights in the pursuit of life, liberty, and property to such an extent that their freedom was of little value. Colored citizens were in some states forbidden to even appear in town. They were required to reside on and cultivate the soil without the right to purchase or own it. They were excluded from many occupations and they were not permitted to testify in any court where a white man was a party. National observers at that time concluded that the Democratic South was simply trying to institute a new form of slavery through the use of these black codes. Representative Richard Kane of South Carolina agreed. When the government of the United States had made the black man free, when Congress, in the greatness of its majesty, prepared to give to every class of men their rights, and in reconstructing the southern states, guaranteed to all the people 
their liberties. Democrats refuse to agree to the laws enacted by Congress. You Democrats refuse to, and I quote, accept the situation. To recognize the rights of that class of men in this land, you sought to make the Reconstruction Acts a nullity, if possible. You sought to re-enslave the black man by every means in your power. Southern Democrats went well beyond black codes, however, and also imposed forced segregation. Those Democratic pro-segregation state laws replaced the anti-segregation federal laws passed by Republicans in 1875, and regrettably, those state laws became the legal standard for the next 75 years. The sixth device to disenfranchise black voters was bizarre gerrymandering. Once Democrats regained state legislatures, they began to redraw election lines to make it impossible for Republicans to be elected, thereby preventing blacks from being elected. For example, after Reconstruction, Democrats regained the legislature and began to redraw voting lines so that when the last African American left the Texas State House in 1897, not another one was elected, either as a Republican or a Democrat, for the next 70 years until federal courts struck down the way Texas Democrats drew voting lines. This pattern was typical in other southern states as well. The seventh device used to disenfranchise black voters was that of white-only primaries. When the U.S. Supreme Court finally struck down the state law in 1927, the Democratic Party simply enacted internal Democratic Party policies to prevent blacks from voting in Democratic primaries. And because Democrats at that time solidly controlled every level of government in the South, this Democratic Party policy had the same effect as a state law and thus ensured that no black would be elected. In 1935, the Supreme Court upheld this Democratic Party policy of white-only primaries. But in 1944, the court reversed itself and finally struck them down. The eighth device used by Democrats to disenfranchise black Americans was that of physical intimidation and violence. Obviously, the Ku Klux Klan was a leader in this form of violent voter intimidation. As confirmed by Representative James T. Rapier of Alabama, Democrats were hunting me down like the partridge on the mount, night and day with their Ku Klux Klan, simply because I was a Republican and refused to bow at the feet of their bail. The ninth device used by Democrats to disenfranchise black voters was the revision of state constitutions to negate many of the rights that had been gained. Other devices employed by Democrats to keep blacks from voting included property ownership requirements. Democrats also used restrictive eligibility requirements, such as residing in a state two years before voting or the paying of excessive annual voter registration fees, fees not struck down by the courts until 1971. Democrats utilized nearly a dozen devices to keep black Americans from voting, something that would have come as no surprise to the earliest African-American civil rights leaders. For example, Representative Joseph Hayne Rainey had earlier declared, You cannot expect the Negro to rise while the Democrats are trampling upon him and his rights. We ask you, sir, to do by the Negro as you ought to do by him in justice. If the Democrats are such staunch friends of the Negro, why is it that when new propositions are offered here and elsewhere, looking into the elevation of the colored race and the extension of right and justice to them, why do the Democrats array themselves in unbroken ranks and vote against every such measure? Frederick Douglass agreed with Rainey and also confirmed the basic Democratic hostility for those civil rights. Douglass had explained, in all the southern states, the 14th and 15th amendments of the Constitution are practically of no force or effect. By means of the shotgun and midnight raid, the old master class has triumphed over the newly enfranchised citizen and put the Constitution under their feet. The colored people who largely outnumber the whites and who are Republican politics have been banished from the ballot box and robbed of representation in the councils of the nation. And the social condition of the colored people in that section is but little above what it was in the time of slavery. The unrelenting Democratic efforts to suppress black voting were successful. For example, in Mississippi in 1892, 
There were almost 70,000 more blacks than whites in the state. Yet white voters outnumbered black voters by a margin of eight to one. And in Birmingham, of the 18,000 blacks who lived in that city at the turn of the century, only 30 were eligible to vote. In Texas, the number of black voters fell from 100,000 to only 5,000. The number of black voters in Alabama and Florida was reduced by nearly 90%. And by the 1940s, only 5% of blacks in the South were registered to vote. In fact, in 1965 in Selma, Alabama, a city with more black residents than white residents, the voting rolls were 99% white and only 1% black. Clearly, democratic voter suppression efforts had been successful. Returning to the 1800s, recall that Democrats regained partial control of Congress in 1876. That partial control continued for the next 16 years until 1893, when Democrat Grover Cleveland was elected as president and Democrats gained control of both the House and the Senate. For the first time since Abraham Lincoln, the Democrats had full control of the lawmaking process. Given their new powers, what did Democrats do to assist civil rights? Nothing. Not a single civil rights law was passed by Democrats during that time. In fact, the Democrats immediately passed laws repealing civil rights laws that had not yet been struck down by the Supreme Court. Specifically, Democrats repealed the laws protecting black voting rights as well as those punishing Klan violence. By 1900, Democrats actually began actively to seek the repeal of the 14th and 15th Amendments. As Democratic Senator Ben Tillman from South Carolina explained, We made up our minds that the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were themselves null and void, that the Civil Rights Acts of Congress were null and void, that oaths required by such laws were null and void.